So now that we've just learned the basics about how an ANOVA works, I want to give you some of the properties of what we're doing. And so to remind you, an ANOVA stands for the analysis of variance. And as you saw in that video, we were analyzing variability and breaking it down into its parts. So this term analysis of variance works. And we use ANOVA rather than the acronym AOV because then I would be telling you how we run an AOV and that doesn't really flow well, so we are going to call it the ANOVA, which is the analysis of variance. Now I want to talk to you about what we were doing before and how that relates to what we're doing now. So we were using the t-distribution and we had different kinds of t-tests. When we were looking at independent sample t's, we were looking at two population means and seeing how they compared. But what happens when we have three or more means? I'm going to tell you the independent t is no longer adequate. We cannot run independent t-tests when we have three or more groups. And there's a several reasons for that, but I think it's really important that you take away from this lecture that if you have three or more groups in your data, you need to be running an ANOVA. If you have two groups, you can run an independent t. But if you have three separate groups, five separate groups, eight separate groups, then that needs to be run as an ANOVA. So one of the reasons why we can't do a t-test is a more minor reason. It's kind of tedious to compare all the possible combinations of groups. So let's just say I had three groups. I'd do one versus two, then two versus three, then one versus three. That's kind of a lot of work. But a more important reason why um, it's important to not run an independent t-test when you have three or more groups is that any statistic that is based on only part of the evidence which would be the case if we were just doing a paired comparison, say one versus two, is less stable than one based on all of the evidence. In other words, if I'm just looking at groups one versus two and I completely ignore the fact that three is in there, I'm ignoring my data and my statistics are less stable, less reliable. They're not going to be truly informative. If I instead factor in the entire piece, groups one, two, and three at the same time, I now have something that is more stable, something that I can rely on as being an accurate reflection of the picture and not being uh, subjected to variability that um, is just inherent due to looking at only a small piece of the data. So we want to look at everything. We don't want to just look at one piece. Okay, another way of exemplifying this is if I were trying to create a distribution uh, let's say of classroom scores in my class and I wanted to understand how the class was doing, do you see how it would be misleading if I only just took two students and tried to understand the entire distribution just from two students? I want to take the whole picture into account so that I can understand the entire distribution and that's really what I'm trying to say here is that if we're only looking at um, a single paired comparison, we're missing out on the really big picture and it's not going to be as reliable as looking at the whole picture. To me, the most important reason why we cannot run uh, a t independent t-test on three or more groups is because it does something that we say inflates alpha. So let's say I have three groups and I compare in an inappropriately with an independent t-test groups one versus two and I set my alpha rate to be 5%. Then let's say I compare groups two and three and I set my alpha rate to be 5%. And then I compare groups one and three, and I set my alpha rate to be 5%. So each paired comparison had an alpha rate of 5%. But once I'm done with my study, what do you think my alpha rate is for the entire combination of all three groups? It would be 15%. That's not cool. Remember, in research, we have to have our alpha rate be below 5%. We want the overall alpha rate to remain 5%. So if I have more than two groups, I'm inherently inflating my alpha for each paired comparison that I do. So we don't want to do that. We want to use an ANOVA. An ANOVA can maintain the overall alpha rate for our groups at 5%. So that's our goal, is to maintain an alpha rate of 5%, so our rejection region is only 5%, and then um, I can move forward from there. So we need to have this test, which tells us that there's a difference somewhere. Here's what's unique about the ANOVA. It is what's called an omnibus test. So an omnibus test is a test that tells you, hey, there's a difference in here somewhere, but I can't do paired comparisons, so I can't tell you where. I'm just gonna tell you there's a difference in here somewhere. 
This can be a hard concept to wrap our head around, and my students seem to like this analogy, so let's just go with it. Imagine an omnibus is kind of a, a, a tricky neighbor kid who's always got, um, um, well, I don't know, like a game to play, and they have a black bag in front of them, and they say, hey, try to guess what's in my bag, and you go, why don't you tell me? And they open up the bag and look, and they say, I'm not going to tell you what's in here, but I'm going to tell you there is a significant difference in here. And then they are not going to tell you whether it's group one versus two that's different or two versus three that's different. They're just going to tell you there's something interesting in that black bag. That would be the omnibus test. So that's how the ANOVA maintains the alpha rate at 5% is that it doesn't run every paired comparison. But in that analysis of variance, that omnibus test with the little black bag can tell you something in there was significantly different. We don't know if it was one was different from two or if one was different from three or if two was different from three or if all three of them were different from each other. All we know is that there was a difference in there somewhere. And tricky omnibus isn't going to tell us where, but it is going to tell us that there was a difference worth pursuing. So if our tricky neighbor friend said, I looked in the black bag and basically there's nothing there, there's no differences, then that's not interesting. We just stop looking. We wouldn't move forward trying to figure out, try to guess and see where the differences are. Do you see how that would be the case if somebody had a black bag and they said, oh, try to guess what color um, things I have, they're all the same color, then you're not, it's not that interesting. But if you say, well, there's some different colors in there, I'm not going to tell you what the colors are, then we would want to keep asking questions and figuring out what's going on in that black bag. So with the omnibus test, we are going to be using the F distribution. And the F distribution or the F test is a ratio of variances like you saw in our past or last video. And we're going to use the F distribution that Fisher made. I don't know if you remember, I referenced Fisher in an earlier lecture. So Fisher made this really cool F distribution um, to accommodate our need for analysis of variance. There's a couple reasons why the T distribution no longer works. Um, and I think it helps pictorially to look at it, but I just wanted to point out that we are no longer using the T distribution. We are using the F distribution. So for example, when we did an independent T, we used the T distribution. When we did a dependent T, we used it and compared it to a T distribution. When we did a one sample T, we compared it to a T distribution. And now we're doing an ANOVA and we're going to compare it to an F distribution. And what's nice about the F distribution is that's actually used repeatedly for other tests. It's a, a very nice distribution. And ANOVA happens to be one of the tests that use the F distribution. Sometimes you'll have people, you'll hear people call the ANOVA an F test. It's a type of F test, just like an independent T is a type of T test. So there's not just one F test, um, just like there's not just one T test. And I clarify that because if you dig deeper into the reading, sometimes students get confused between the phrase F test and ANOVA. An ANOVA is just a type of F test that uses the F distribution. There's one last piece I want to say before I move forward talking to you more about this F distribution, and that's this concept of an omnibus test. When we had an independent T test, it actually is an omnibus test, right? So somebody ran, our neighbor ran an independent T test and they were looking at the differences between males and females and then they threw the differences in the bag and then I asked my neighbor, ooh, is there a difference between males and females? And the neighbor says, I am looking in my bag, I can't tell you what's happening, but I can tell you there's a difference. Tricky, tricky omnibus. Well, when there's only two groups, then it's very clear which two groups differed from each other. It was that males were different from females. Now we could look at their means to decide who was higher or who was lower, but we needed to know if there was a significant difference before we looked at the means to see if there was anything meaningful there. So if Omnibus says, well, hey, I'm going to look and oh, males, or I'm not going to tell you who's different, but I'm going to tell you there was a difference in my bag. And I go, well, you only looked at males versus females. So I know that males were significantly different from females. I can go look at the means and find out what it was. So an independent t-test is an omnibus test. It just wasn't hard to figure out what was in that black bag because there were only two groups.
But for an ANOVA, if we ask Omnibus, is there a difference somewhere? And an Omnibus says, hmm, yeah, there's something different in this bag. There are so many ways in which there could be a difference. We can no longer guess just by looking at the means. We have to do further testing to ask, or sorry, to follow up and figure out where the test is. But you could see how if Omnibus says, yeah, there's no differences in this bag, it's not worth pursuing anymore. We shouldn't move forward because there's nothing to look for. So I wanted to show you a picture of the T distribution versus the F distribution. The T distribution it looked very much like a normal distribution, especially as it had a larger sample size that started to approximate more of a normal distribution, which is represented here in black. Now remember, we use degrees of freedom to indicate um, the different distribution shapes. And as our degrees of freedom gets smaller, the, um, the oh, that's so weird. These should be getting smaller. Um, as our degrees of freedom gets smaller, the distribution gets flatter and wider. Now I wanted to show you what the F distribution looks like. Notice that the F distribution is created um, based on two sets of degrees of freedom. That's because we have more complicated data coming in. So it's not just based on one degree of freedom, but on two. It's still based on this concept of N minus one, but um, I want you to see how the shape drastically changes from, um, from distribution to distribution depending on what your degrees of freedom are. Notice these all sim look very similar, but this one changes shape dramatically. And so this is one of the reasons why moving forward, I've always taught students to draw their rejection regions in a nice normal distribution. I start to steer away from that because if you really wanted to accurately draw your rejection region, you'd have to know exactly what shape the F distribution would look like for this particular case and then make sure that you draw your rejection region appropriately. So we start kind of moving away from drawing it, but I think you should be okay with that by now because now you know the language around rejection regions and how to write them. And hopefully you know how to interpret the p-values, which I think is where the meat is moving forward. So this concept of degrees of freedom, I just wanted you to know how you would look up your critical value is you have two sets of degrees of freedom. Now remember, we had the numerator of the ANOVA was the mean squared between and the denominator was the mean squared within. So we actually have a degrees of freedom for both sets. The degrees of freedom between would be the number of groups minus one. So if you have three groups, it'd be three minus one, which equals two. The degrees of freedom for the within is n minus one for each set of groups you have. So in this particular case, if we had three groups, we'd have n minus one for the first group, n minus one for the second group, and n minus one for the third group. So you just add them all together. So see that there's a pattern of still something minus one. It's just you have multiples of n minus one for each group that you have. And another way to think about this is it's the total number of subjects in your study minus the number of groups, because I'd have n1 plus n2 plus n3 minus the um, number of groups here, which is three. So this is what you would use to define your rejection region. And you may have noticed when we were looking at the different shapes of the distributions, when we're comparing, this is the T distribution and this is the, um, the F distribution, they look very different. And one of the things I wanna point out is that unlike the T distribution where we could have it be two-tailed or one-tailed, the F distribution is non-directional. Sometimes students mistakenly think it's always one-tailed, and it really isn't upper-tailed or lower-tailed. We just say it doesn't have a, a direction. And so when we have a test for two means, it makes sense that it can be directional or non-directional. If I had this two-tailed test and I wanted to see maybe my alternative distribution was in the upper tail, I now know whether you know I can use this cutoff to decide if it's in the rejection region or not. Or if I wanted to make it one-tailed, um, I could see if the alternative distribution was in that upper tail. But when you have three um, distributions, you have three kind of uh, mountains that you're comparing, which one would you make be the upper tail versus the two tail? Is it the one in the middle? Or is it the one on the left or the one on the right? Do you see how we have so many tails that it would be very difficult to define which tail would be the tail that we would put the rejection region in, right? And so it doesn't make sense to have tailedness when you have so many distributions you're comparing it to. And so our ANOVAs, we say, are non-directional. And so we only do two-tailed versus one-tailed when we have... Um, t-tests and z-tests, which might be good for some of you because you might have been struggling to know when it was one-tailed versus two-tailed and you don't have to worry about that anymore.
So there's um, a couple reasons why this is. The first is what I just said. There's a number of ways in which the null may be false. Is it that the third group is different from the first group, or that the second group is different from the third group, or the first group is different from the second group. There's so many ways in which it could be false that we don't know where to put those tails. The other um, reason why, and the primary reason why this is non-directional, is remember, we were doing squared deviations. We took the sums of squares, and we divided it by the degrees of freedom, so we had mean squared between and mean squared within, and that created our F distribution. So we had square deviations, which means that all of our values are positive. Remember, when you square a negative number, it becomes positive. So notice that our distribution doesn't have negative f values. So because of that squaring, there's no way for us to have a lower-tailed test. So we don't consider um, ANOVAs to be directional. We would just find our critical value, and any f value above that marker would be considered in the rejection region.